the ordinary. That's a pretty good introduction. Um, I guess I'll start with, I didn't actually do this as a QS project. Um, this was just something that I had done and Sarah actually sort of picked it up and I mean it really does follow the QS model. Um, so thank you for hearing me out. Um, my full talk is called The Chemist's Guide to Hacking Parkinson's Disease because um, that's just sort of my background and where I come from and I'll explain to you a little bit about me before I can talk about what I've done. I want to introduce you to sort of my situation. I have juvenile onset Parkinson's disease. Um, I'm almost 22, a couple weeks, um, and I've had it since I was 14. 14. Um, that was my first symptoms of onset. It took them a long time to figure out what was going on because they don't expect Parkinson's in a 14 year old. Um, I was diagnosed at 18 with something called dopa responsive dystonia, which is sort of like a Parkinson's mimic, but it's very stable on dosages. Um, so you could take Parkinson's treatment for years and be okay. I kept needing more and more and more. Um, and when I was 20 years old, I developed really severe dyskinesia in 2014. Um, and so that led to sort of this eight month rapid decline. And I had deep brain stimulation in June of 2015. Um, dystonia is one of my biggest symptoms. Dystonia, um, I had muscle spasms that went through my whole body. I had um, rigidity in my shoulders and my hips and I had um, my mild tremors and I could barely pick my legs up off. My symptoms had gotten so bad. Um, this eight month decline let me, left me in stage four at age 20. So I had deep brain stimulation. And that fixed the majority of my major motor symptoms. Um, those are mostly gone. And so, um, I, a little more about me. I went to University of Redlands. I just graduated with my degree in chemistry in April. Um, so that's sort of my background. Um, and that's, I've always used chemistry as sort of a model to understand my Parkinson's, and understand the whole world. I mean, the whole world is based on molecular chemistry, if you really think about it. Um, and so that's sort of how I frame everything. Um, a little more about my Parkinson's. It got really complicated right after I had my DBS. Um, I developed a, very, a fairly rare side effect to Parkinson's. Um, I don't want to say side effect, but co-disease essentially, called gastrophoresis and digestive tract paralysis. Um, what that means is that Parkinson's messed up my vagus nerve, and my stomach no longer contracts, and my small intestine moves super slowly. So I can't eat any food. I don't eat food. If I eat food, it will get stuck in my stomach, I'll throw it up. Um, sometimes I could throw up food from four days ago. It's, it's bad, my stomach just doesn't work. So I lost a bunch of weight because I wasn't able to get any nutrition. Um, and so I had a feeding tube placed in December. Um, and my feeding tube lasted about six months. Um, I was using that to feed constantly, um, but I was just not able, to, by the end of the six months, I was not able to get enough calories. I couldn't run it fast enough. I was only running like 40 mils um, per hour, which if you think about a cup of water, that's about 236 milliliters. Mm -hmm. So think about getting a cup of food over like hours and hours. Um, it, it just wasn't working. And so I had to switch to something called total parental nutrition. Um, I have a pig line in my arm. It's like a gigantic IV. And every night I feed through my IV. I feed a huge gigantic bag, that bag in the corner. That's my food for the day. Um, and so what I was doing was putting all of my medication through my, through my feeding tube because the medication has to bypass my stomach or it won't get to me. Um, so a little bit about what a J-tube does. So this is a GJ tube, like I have. It goes through the stomach and there's like this long extension that goes into your small intestine. And that's how I got medicine, nutrition, and hydration. Um, and after the feeding tube failed for, for nutrition and hydration, I just get medicine. Um, and so the small intestine is actually where all that is absorbed. So by skipping the stomach, I was able to give myself the medication. Um, so that's how I took Cinnamet and all my other Parkinson's medication. Every four hours, I would crush up one and a half Cinnamet and push it down my tube. All day. <laughs> um, that's sort of my life. Um, but then I found this, there's a treatment. Um, I'm not going to mention the name of it, but it's a levodopa enteral suspension. And what that means is that it's like a levodopa gel that goes into your small intestine. They actually put J-tubes in people like mine to give them constant levodopa, um, which works better than just taking pills because you're getting a constant stream. And they can customize it just to you. 
they can calculate your dosages based on what you take and adjust it accordingly. Um, and so here I am sitting with the J tube that's just used for medication, and I'm like, why don't I have this? My insurance hasn't covered it yet. They haven't gotten to it yet, and they probably won't for at least a year. Um, so that was my dilemma, and this is what I did. I made my own. Um, that's why a lot of you have been like, oh, you're the, you're the girl who made her, who rigged up her feeding tube. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I made my own suspension um, using some chemistry tricks that I learned. Um, so these are a couple pictures. What I actually do is I crush up 10 cinnamet, which is 1,000 milligrams, and I um, put some, some lecithin in there, which I'll talk about how it works. But it's a phospholipid that basically allows me to go from cinnamet powder, which if you mix cinnamet powder and water, it'll sit at the bottom. It won't mix with the water at all. So you can see that nice little um, cup, yellow cup, that's a mixed solution. It's even. There's cinnamon evenly distributed through the whole thing. Um, and so actually, now would be a good time to show you what it looks like, because I've been rigging it up to my feeding tube. But this is my medicine for the day. Um, and so here's how it works. So that's a cinnamon, or that's levodopa. Carbidopa looks pretty similar too. You need both. Um, levodopa, if you notice, there's no charges. Water is very charged. That's why they don't mix. So I had to introduce something that had both a charged end and a non-charged end to distribute it evenly. So I had some, so th this is something less than, has these phospholipids. The phospholipid has that, see that circle is very charged and the little tail is non-charged. And so what will happen is these molecules will end up in bubbles of phospholipids. And then the water can interact with the charged part and the phospholipid tail that's non-charged can inter interact with cinnamon, with, with levodopa and carbidopa. Um, and so that basically makes it soluble in water and it gives you an even distribution. So there's the same amount of cinnamet here as there is here in your solution. So I can calculate a rate to pump it evenly. Um, and so what I do every morning is I give myself a bump dose. I, I calculated it to be 120 milligrams just based off of what I had been taking. And so I give myself a bump dose in the morning and then after that I get to just run it for the rest of the day on the lower dose. So I'm actually right here getting 34 milligrams of levodopa per day, or per hour, sorry, um, which adds up to a pretty similar doses, dosage as what I was taking. Uh, so this is what less of it, a little bit about less of it. That's what it looks like. See, these little phospholipids are the uncharged part that's interacting. Um, and the solution is literally just cinnamon at a dosage that I've calculated less than and water. That's it. It was so simple. Um, and so when I started doing it, I'll tell you a little bit about the results that I've gotten from having this constant suspension. I mean, it's been pretty well covered. Constant cinnamon is, or levodopa is much better for the brain than having that tail off. When you have that drop off, you get all kinds of crazy symptoms. It's just, and having it, think about regular people. Healthy people have a constant stream of dopamine that their body's producing. We don't. Um, and so by doing that, it, it's tricking your brain into thinking it's healthy, basically. Um, it's harder for me to track my symptoms because I've had DBS. The non-motor symptoms are much harder to quantify. I get internal tremors. I have a lot of body pain overall. Um, sensory overstimulation, loud noises will make me freeze. Um, some certain fabrics, when it's flaring, will cause like electric type pain to go up my body. Um, and then there's just overall stamina. All of those bad things have decreased since I've been on this, especially motor coordination was in my hands. I would pick stuff up and accidentally throw it because I had this jerk, um, which is really embarrassing in class when you're trying to pick up a pencil and you throw it three feet. <laughs> or when you're trying to open your cinnamon and you jerk and you spill 600 cinnamon all over your room and you're finding little yellow pills everywhere for the next three months. Um, that's gone, which is a huge quality of life thing for me. Um, and so it's, I'm just much happier like this. I can also, um, if I want to disconnect, I can prime some of it in my body and disconnect. And it's like taking a pill. And then I can connect later. Um, now, what happens when I did this? The problem was I was getting dehydrated, which is probably only a problem for me because I can't just drink water like a normal person. So I added saline during the day. And I fixed that. Um, and then there's dyskinesias, which I know you're all very familiar with. Um, so my kind of dyskinesia is sort of this like wobbly in my shoulders, 
Um, if it gets really bad, it'll be like limb flailing, but it's kind of this wobbly feeling um, during the day, and that was just annoying. Uh, Amantadine, the only medicine approved for dyskinesia, was horrible for me. It ruined my blood pressure and heart rate. I just, I can't be on it. It, it was a disaster. So what I naturally did was turn to science, because that's what I always do. Um, and so I found this study about nicotine um, affecting dyskinesias. It's a primate study. So they use these monkeys, and they poison them with something called MPTP, which is a chemical that can give people Parkinsonism. So they poison these poor monkeys, um, and then they treated them with levodopa, and they got better. And then they treated, um, they gave them enough to get dyskinesia. Um, and then they treated half of them with nicotine before they got dyskinesia, and half of them afterwards. Both groups saw 60 to 70 percent decreases in the dyskinesia. Um, and the most important part here is that there was no increase in their Parkinson's. So basically what this study is telling us is that nicotine can reduce dyskinesias and is not going to worsen your overall disease. So naturally I experiment. Um, I figured out I would introduce nicotine into my body some way. So there's a couple methods to do that. I could smoke, but I'm not going to do that. I already have Parkinson's. I don't really need lung cancer too. <laughs> there's that. Um, there's a couple other different methods. I could do patches, gums, vape. Um, and I ended up chewing, choosing vape simply because it gets into your body instantly and um, it's, I can take it as needed as opposed to just having a constant stream. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So I'd actually been vaping for a little while because I can't eat food and I was vaping non-nicotine flavors just for the flavor. Um, and there's some really great ones out there. Um, but the best part is I can control the dosage. So when I decided to start nicotine to try to control my dyskinesias, I just got a low dose, three megs per mil, and I'll show you my vape here. It's a two milligram tank, or two milliliter tank rather. So in this tank, if it's full, it's got six milligrams of nicotine. The highest, the lowest patch that you can get is R7, so it's a really low dose. So what I've been doing was every time I get dyskinetic, I just take a puff. It's really simple. It's easy. Um, and it helps, it fixes the dyskinesia, um, and it's really safe at low dose. I'm actually gonna show you a little video. Do you need the sound? Because we need to start to speak it. Uh, okay. um, I actually don't need the sound. Okay. Let me just, I'll just talk about it instead of having. Okay, so that's me dyskinetic. I was at my friend's place, um, and I was just, I took too much. I primed too much into me. Whoops. Um, so I took the opportunity to have her take a video of me getting better with the bit with the bait. Um, you can see how bad my ankle's pulling like that. See it's slowly starting to calm down. And I ran out of battery and so I took my friends. <laughs> this is a very poorly planned video, I apologize. <laughs> I just took the opportunity, I, I messed up. But you can see my arm is starting to calm down. stopping driving because of the sensory stuff, because like loud noises will just make me jump and freeze, and that's really bad for driving. Um, and I live in LA, which has like not a lot of public transit, so what was I going to do? It was going to take away a huge part of my independence. Um, and daily life was just getting more difficult, and this, this just makes so much improvement on my daily life. Um, also the biggest thing is I felt like I was out of med options. Before with my dosage, I had hit that threshold where I just had like tiny dyskinesias. Um, and so I knew I was out of options. I couldn't take more medication because then I'd get really bad dyskinesias and I had no way of controlling them. Um, so I felt like I was out of options. I had this like, you know, not so much hope because I knew my disease was gonna progress. We have progressive disease. 
So in a couple years, when my symptoms got beyond the control of my current dosages, what was I going to do? Here, I'm still variable. I'm, I can always add more. I can always make the concentration higher, readjust the math. And the dyskinesias are controlled by the nicotine. I have so many more options now. Um, and really what that taught me is that it's not so much that I'm, I, don't, I will never have options. It's just that I have an option I need to find. Um, and so I always like to take it back to like why I study science. Um, and it's really just because I sort of frame my whole world around science. Um, you know, first law of thermodynamics, anyone? And you know, the law is, if you think of your body as a system, you have this energy going on, you have this symptom, and you put medication in, it's going to cause some other reaction. And it's all about managing these reactions, identifying the reaction, and figuring out something you can do to transfer that energy into something positive. So, to summarize my results sort of <laughs> on this, I call it to be continued, because we have a progressive and degenerative disease. This is something that keeps going. The management of it just doesn't end. Um, but that's okay, we just have to keep innovating and keep trying. And you know, right now this regimen's awesome, but I know it's not gonna work forever. And so when it goes out, well, I just have to come up with another solution, come up with another hypothesis, and test it again. There's this hope now for me, knowing that there's always something else I can do. Um, and so uh, thank you all for listening. I just wanna thank a couple people.